Now, as, as uh, uh, our elder alluded to the fact, um, I gained a certain notoriety with religious liberty sermons, but that's not my first love. My first love is Jesus. And when I was 13, I had a wayward teenager heart, and uh, the preacher went to a camp meeting, and he was preaching on Hosea and Goma. The preacher was a revivalist from Kingston, Jamaica, and he was preaching about Hosea and Goma and God's love for wayward hearts. And I realized that I had a wayward heart, and God was calling me back to him. So I went forward at the altar call at the age of 13, and it was the best decision I ever made. So young people, I want to challenge you today to give your lives to Jesus Christ, uh, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And in a lost world, you do not want to be without a moral compass. So uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, one of the stories of Jesus, because that's my first love. And as we're in the shadow of Loma Linda, I thought I'd pick out a, a topic on the healing ministry of Jesus, uh, because I'm, I assume there must be some hospital administrators or physicians or PTs or nurses or people involved in the healing, uh, healing profession here today. So I want to talk about a healing miracle of Jesus. And I picked uh, the story of Jairus and the woman with the issue of blood. So that's the sermon I've prepared for this morning. And I ask you to bow your heads with me and invite the Holy Spirit to bless our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, your spirit inspired Mark to write this story for the uh, Christians of Rome. Lord, in a multicultural society, he announced that there is another king, and that king is Jesus. And this story, Father, teaches us about how Jesus deals with the broken of body. So, Father, I pray that the same spirit that inspired Mark will work upon me today, that you will anoint my lips, you will guard what I say and think, that everything I say will be from your throne of grace. Father, may our hearts be ready to be changed, may our feet be ready, be ready to be led, may our minds be transformed by the hearing of your word. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'm not using PowerPoint this morning, and... Um, uh, there's various reasons for that, but I'm not using that today. But I would invite you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter uh, 5. We're going to be focusing on this passage here today. We're not going to talk about the demoniac. We're going to talk about Jairus and then the woman with the issue of blood. And I just want to set the context. Before we narrow down into the story, I want to set the context here. Mark, you can divide into three portions. You know, I, I like to think of the structure of things. I don't know how you think of books in the Bible. But I like to know that you know, Deut uh, Isaiah is like first Isaiah, and then there's the second half Isaiah from 40 onwards. That's why I kind of divide it in my mind. And Mark has essentially three major components. And Mark 1 through 8, the end of chapter 8, really, is the Galilean ministry of Jesus up in the north of Israel, or the Holy Land. And Jesus is a man of action. He's healing, he's preaching, he's te teaching, he's casting out demons, he's raising the dead, he's teaching in parables, particularly Mark 4, the parable of the sower. Those are the first major teachings we have in this gospel, Mark 4. And uh, he's met by, um, by a skeptical crowd. You know, Jesus has this incredible teaching, incredible um, preaching, and yet wherever he goes, he meets opposition from the authorities, he meets skepticism within his family, um, there is um, popular applause from a fickle crowd that follows him around, and there is a tenuous commitment from the twelve. So far, up until Mark 5, there is no example, really, of, of a man of faith or a woman of faith who comes to Jesus and is saved per se. Uh, we, we assume it happens before that, but here we have the first explicit examples. And so um, I've got to get ahead of myself a bit there. So the three components of Mark, 1 through 8 is the, is the, the Galilean ministry. And at the end of that passage in Mark 8, about 27, you have the story of Jesus with the man who's blind. And Jesus spits in the ground and touches the man on his eyes. And the man opens his eyes and Jesus says, can you see something? And the man says, yes, but they're like trees walking around. You know, it's like... Everybody is right now, okay? Well, last night I was here and they dropped all the lights and they only kept these spotlights on. You know, I couldn't see anybody out there. I assumed there was a congregation out there. So I spoke, I spoke by faith last night. So um, the man, he, and so Jesus um, touches his eyes again and uh, he says some words to him. You see them in Mark 8 there. And then the man can see clearly. And the point is that disciples need the repeated touch of Jesus to see clearly that you cannot say that I was baptized 40 years ago and that's it for me. I don't need to grow spiritually. That we need the repeated touch of Jesus as we go through life in order to see 
how we are to live and how we are to follow Jesus. And that, that implies we are to keep growing day by day in our faith. So we need the repeated touch of Jesus. Then you have the road to Jerusalem from the confession in Caesarea Philippi that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, says Peter, all the way through to the end of chapter 10, 52, where you have blind Bartimaeus, and who is a, a, a pictured as a, as a perfect disciple um, in, the, in the Gospel of Mark. And then from 11 onwards, you have the Passion narrative through to weeks, chapter 16. So Mark is divided into three components, and where we're looking at today is in the middle of the Galilean ministry in the first component of Mark. And this is where we find the first real people of faith. And so um, the, the context, though, and where is this story actually happening, the story of Jairus? And his daughter. Well, if you look in Matthew 9, when Jesus comes back from healing the, the demoniac on the other side of the lake, he comes back to his hometown, which is what Mark 5.21 says. He's coming back to the Jewish side of Galilee, but he goes to Capernaum, his hometown, and he goes to the house of Matthew Levi. Now, Matthew Levi was a publican, which means he, was a, he worked for the IRS, um, which meant he was a traitor. I mean, I'm not saying if you work for the IRS, you are a traitor. I'm saying that in those days, if you were a tax collector for the emperor of Rome, you were considered a traitor. And the Jewish Sicarii and the zealots would walk up behind tax collectors with their curved knives and you know, give it to them in the ribs. Uh, it was a dangerous job. They were corrupt. They made a lot of money by um, extorting money from, from the people. And so Jesus goes and he eats with Matthew, who is a traitor, with his fellow traitors. And there are sinners, which is a euphemism for women of ill repute. So you might say that Jesus in this story is going to a Hooters bar. Let's be honest. He's going where no self-respecting rabbi or scribe or Sadducee would ever go. Why? Because the Son of Man did not come to condemn, but to save. God did not send his Son to the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be Saved, John 3, 17. So Jesus is at a place where no self-respecting Jewish religious leader would ever be seen dead because in that place there are women who are, are men who are open to the gospel. And it's in this context that we find the story of Jairus. And so Jairus, we're going to pick up the story in verse in Mark, Matthew 5, sorry, Mark 5, sorry, Mark 5, verse 22. It says there, then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and he begged him repeatedly. And if you look at this chapter just in your Bibles, you'll notice that um, from Mark 5, 21 through 24, you have the story of Jairus. Then the story of Jairus picks up again from verse 35 to the end of the chapter. And in the middle, you have the story of the woman with the issue of blood. Do you see that in your Bibles? Uh, this is what you know, the scholars will call a, a sandwich construction. If I give you a sandwich, if, if at potluck today somebody says, would you like a sandwich? Your response is, well, what kind of sandwich is it? See, a sandwich is defined not by the bread on the outside, but what's in the inside. Yes, is it a PB and J? Is it, I don't know, cheese and tomato? Is it peanut butter and marmite? I mean, who knows what's in the sandwich? What's in the sandwich defines whether you want the sandwich, yes? Uh, the, the, the filling defines, the, it adds meaning to the sandwich. And so if you look just uh, on Matthew, Mark 6, oh, I don't know why I keep saying Matthew this morning. We're in Mark, let's stick in Mark. If you look at Mark 6 in verse 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10, 11 and 12 and 13, that's where Jesus sends out the disciples. And then if you look at Mark 6 and verse 30, it says the disciples gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And so you have two, two ends of the sandwich. Jesus sends them out. And then about 30 verses later, they come back to Jesus and they say all that they've done. What have they been doing? They've been casting out demons, raising the dead, teaching to large crowds and to popular applause and healing the sick. And you'd imagine that being a disciple of Jesus is a one-way ticket to popular acclaim and applause and popularity. But in the middle of this, Mark sandwiches the story of John the Baptist. Who dies for his faith. And it's a reminder to those 12 and a reminder to us today that if you become a disciple of Jesus, you would be wrong to assume it's a one-way ticket to popular acclaim and popular applause. That we do have to pay a cost. There is a cost for following Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer understood that in the cost of discipleship, written during the Nazi era in Germany. And so we're going to come back to this, this sandwich with Jairus and the woman here. I'm going to pick up the story with Jairus, and it says there, Jairus, one of the leaders of the synagogue. He is, you might say in Hebrew, Rosh HaKneset, the head of the synagogue. Now, he's not a Pharisee, and he's not a scribe, and he's not a Sadducee, and he's not a Herodian. He is a lay leader elected by the synagogue members to lead their synagogue. 
And as such, he is a respected member of the community. He is like your conference president here, someone who's elected by the constituency to lead the body of Christ here in Southeast California. Is that the conference here, by the way? Southeast California, yes. South, South, Southeast California, yes. Okay, thank you. As we say that among the pastors in Minnesota in February, if you get a call to California or February or Florida in February, then God is definitely calling you. You know, the weather here is so nice, you know. So, Anyway, uh, so this is a leader of the synagogue. He's responsible for the preaching, for the preaching roster. He's responsible for the prayer, who prays in the synagogue. He is responsible for appointing the singers in the synagogue. He's responsible for overseeing the poor fund. He's responsible for the public relations of the synagogue. This is a person of serious social standing in Jesus' hometown. And he is very well aware that the Pharisees do not like Jesus, and neither do the scribes, and neither do the Herodians. They've been plotting for Jesus to die for at least three chapters now in the story of Mark. And he must have been aware that Jesus was not approved by the social elites of Jerusalem and of Galilee. And yet, we read here that he comes to Jesus, and he doesn't just come to Jesus after church in the synagogue. He doesn't just come to Jesus alone on the countryside, as does in, in the mountains, as does Nicodemus. He doesn't come to Jesus in a deserted place. He is so desperate to save his daughter that he goes to a hooter's bar to find Jesus sitting down among women of ill repute and traitors. He's desperate to save his daughter. There's no bridge he will not cross in order to save his daughter. He knows what the Pharisees think about Jesus, but he comes up to Jesus and he falls at the feet of Jesus and he says, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on him so that she may be made well and that she may be lived. Literally, eschatos, which is the word eschaton, eschatos eche, which is the end she has, that she's at death's door. The end is nigh. My daughter is dying. I've got nowhere else to go. Would you please come and save my daughter? And what parent would not do absolutely everything for their child? Particularly when your child is at death's door. When maybe the physicians have no further response to help, no further way of helping this child, this desperate father is willing to risk everything to help his daughter. He doesn't uh, rush to the physicians at this stage of his daughter's life. He doesn't consult with the Pharisees about whether it's proper for a conference president to go to a bar like this. He doesn't consult with the Sadducees about whether it's going to affect his social standing if he's seen with Jesus. He's not worried about being publicly canceled by being associated with Jesus. Even though the Pharisees reject Jesus and the Sadducees reject Jesus and the Herodians reject Jesus and the crowd aren't quite sure what they think about Jesus, he stakes everything by entering Matthew's house and bowing before Jesus and begging him to come to his house. He's willing to be socially canceled because of a public declaration of faith in Jesus. Don't think that cancel culture is anything new. In the Gospels, we find it all over the place. John 9, the man who was healed in the temple of blindness, the parents are afraid to, to answer the Pharisees their questions. Why? Because the Pharisees had already agreed that if anybody showed faith in Jesus, they would be excluded from the synagogue. That's like becoming a non-person today. The synagogue administered the poor fund. It's where all the social and communal activities took place. To be excluded from the synagogue meant you became a non-person, financially, socially, professionally, and economically within Jewish society. Cancel culture was alive then as it is today. And this is a man who spent his life serving the synagogue, but his daughter is so desperate and is about to die that he's willing to risk everything for Jesus. And I want to say to you today this, that you cannot turn courage on like a light switch. When that final crisis comes to planet Earth and comes to the United States, do not think that a life of, of going along to get along is going to stand you well in the final crisis. Courage does not appear overnight. We need to exhibit courage for Jesus today in the decisions that we're being required to make today in order that when that final crisis comes, we've already exercised our spiritual muscles so we can stand in the final crisis. And obviously this is a man of courage because he's willing to risk everything for his daughter. He's willing to risk his future as the head of the synagogue. He's willing to risk the condemnation of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But he has courage for his daughter. I want to challenge you today to think about how you're exhibiting courage for Jesus. You know, before David fought Goliath, we discover in 1 Samuel 17 that he'd fought a lion and a bear, hadn't he? So it wasn't a big step. It wasn't, he'd, he'd been faithful with his earthly father's flock. Now he could be faithful with his heavenly father's flock. All right. And so if you're being asked to be made decisions today, and I'm not saying what decisions here because I don't know you as individuals, but whatever decisions you're being made 
or required to make today, be men and women of prayerful courage and follow your convictions. Because if you're not going to follow your convictions now, you're not going to follow them tomorrow. And if you don't follow them tomorrow, you've been so used to compromising, you won't stand in the final crisis. So here is a man who's willing to be cancelled for his public declaration of faith in Jesus. We also notice in this that this is a living faith that is expressed in the public sphere. See, when John 3.16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, we often relegate that so it says, whoever has faith in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But that's not what Jesus said. See, the noun is faith, pistis. But Jesus does not say that whoever has faith in the Son of God will have everlasting life. He says, whoever believes in him, that's a verb. It's not have faith. George Michael sang, you've got to have faith, yeah? Very famous song. That's not what Jesus is talking about. When Jesus says that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, he's saying that belief is a verb that you express in your daily life. To be a follower of Jesus is not just to say, I go to church on Sabbath. It means that I live my faith on a day-to-day basis in every decision that I make. We say in America, are you a Christian? Yes, I go to church. That's probably the wrong answer. Are you a Christian? Yes, I follow Jesus every day. I express my faith every day. I'm not ashamed of my faith any day. I'm willing to live my faith every day, regardless of the consequences, whether it be legal or employment or financial or whatever the case may be. And so this is a man who's willing to be canceled for Jesus. And he says to Jesus, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and that she may live. And it's interesting, you know, in, throughout the Gospels, the verb to heal is the same as the verb to save. So when Jesus says to blind Bartimaeus, some versions say, go in, pay, go in peace, your faith has healed you. You can legitimately translate it, go in faith, go in peace, your faith has saved you. And in the writings of the Gospels, um, physical healing is closely tied to spiritual salvation. And so this man, he comes to Jesus and he says, come and lay your hands on her. And notice this, that throughout the gospel of Mark, Jesus does lay his hands on people to heal them. But that's not a complete understanding of Jesus. This man has an incomplete understanding. He thinks that Jesus must come physically to my house to touch my daughter before she can be made well. Remember that? And yet the Syrophoenician daughter woman comes and says, you you can heal my daughter. The Roman centurion says, you don't need to come to my house. Just say the word and my child will be made well. And Jesus says, I've not found such faith such as this throughout his realm. So this is a man with an incomplete understanding. And yet Jesus honors incomplete understandings. Jesus does not demand in the gospels that we have a perfect systematic theology before he'll reveal himself in our homes and touch our lives. What he's looking for is an active faith, no matter how imperfect the understanding, no matter how imperfect the faith is. Even the man later in this gospel that says, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Jesus honors the little bit of faith that can be found. If you have faith as a mustard seed, that is, I've got to get a magnifying glass, like a PCR test and ramp it up to 100 cycles. We'll find some COVID in you by hook or crook. Sorry, I won't go down that path. But if you look close enough, you find every disease in everybody, I guess. Well, Jesus honors imperfect faith. A classic example of this is China in the 1970s and 1980s. The Chinese underground church grew by tens of millions of people. Story, incredible stories of faith. And if you've never read the story of the Chinese underground church, I'd encourage you to read it. You have stories of people who have no contact with the gospel, who are living essentially animist or Confucian lives in rural villages of China. And a, and a preacher who is on the run from the Chinese Communist Party arrives in your village, gathers a few farmers together, tells a few stories of Jesus, and invites people to accept Jesus as a savior. Then the preacher is gone two hours later because the police are on his path. This happened for about 20, 30 years under Mount Tung and the Gang of Four. There was real persecution of preachers, and these were lay preachers scattering across China, and there are reports from all across China that somebody would say, well, I don't understand everything I heard, but my mother has leprosy, I'm gonna pray for her to be healed, and the mother was healed in the name of Jesus. Or people were raised from the dead in China in the 70s, 80s, 90s, because illiterate peasants in the villages heard that the name of Jesus is all powerful, and they trusted the name of Jesus, and the dead were raised. And the church in China grew like wildfire. It's an incredible story that God does not look for a doctorate in theology. He looks for an ounce of faith. And so Jesus, he goes with her. It says there in verse 24, so Jesus went with him. And a loud crowd, large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. 
Jairus is begging for his child. He doesn't give up on his child. He doesn't say, well, she's about to die. You know, her life is over. You know, I'm going to have a, have a calculated approach to this. I'm going to just stay home and grieve and receive the, the sympathy of the community and let her die rather than risk everything and go and see Jesus. He fights for his daughter. I want to encourage you today to fight for your children as well. You know, support your teachers in your school here. So you have a school here. Support your teachers. Pray for them. Support the pathfinders that are starting up in this school, in this church here now. Pray for your children and don't give up on them. Because no matter what Satan does to them, while there is life, there is hope. Amen. And so Jesus goes with Jairus. And now we come to the story of the woman with the issue of blood. And in my notes, it's called the bleeding woman. And I realize, looking at my notes here, that that's probably not a nice way to refer to it, is it? You know, a, a bleeding woman in, in, from, in, from England, that would be kind of like a term of abuse. So I'm not going to use that, okay? There are only five syllables, the bleeding woman, but the woman with the issue of blood. So that doubles the length of the sermon, if I have to call her that. But I'm going to call her that, right, because I think it's a bit more polite. So anyway, she comes up behind Jesus. It says there in verse 25, Now, follow me in your Bibles, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. Now, unlike Jairus, who has a name and who is a male and who has social standing and is in the synagogue every Sabbath and can come to Jesus face to face and he can say exactly what the problem is, you have a woman without a name who cannot go to the synagogue, who has no social standing, and if people knew that she was present would want her to be locked away because every, every person she touches is now unclean, and who she can't even tell Jesus what her problem is. There's a complete contrast between these two stories. According to the Torah, a woman was ceremonially unclean for seven days after menstruation or for as long as she had an extended problem. And anyone who came into contact with her in Leviticus 15, 29 through 20, 19 through 27, was themselves ceremonially unclean until the end of the day. So as she pushes her way through the crowd, everybody whom she touches is now ceremonially unclean. She's risking a lot to get to Jesus. And she couldn't even go to the temple but Jesus is now replacing the temple as the meeting place between God and humanity. And somehow she has a deeper understanding of Jesus than the scribes and the Pharisees do. And she's pushing through to meet Jesus rather than to go to the temple. Because it's in Jesus that God and humanity finally meet. And she comes up behind Jesus and she touches the hem of his robe. Of his robe. Verse 29, look in your Bible there. It says there that she was healed of her disease. Now, that word for disease is an interesting word that Mark uses. Uh, mastichin, um, it's, I think, I think I pronounced that correctly. Um, it's better translated as a whip or a scourge or as an affliction. This wasn't just a menstrual cycle gone wrong. This was a very painful condition that she was enduring for 12 years. Um, this is when it says in Acts 22, 24, that Paul was going to be scourged with whips. It's the same word that is used there. So this woman has had a painful, shameful condition that's isolated her for 12 years. And we think that a COVID lockdown is bad for one year with all our creature comforts. She's endured a 12-year lockdown with no respite, no possibility of getting out of that lockdown. She is desperate for help. She's gone through COVID isolation multiple times over. She has physical suffering, internal pain, and deep social shame. And because she's uh, ceremonially unclean, nobody wants to go near her. Maybe the closest we have are maybe those uh, elderly folks who were locked into nursing homes in the first months of the COVID crisis, and their relatives would have to come and touch the windows on the outside to see them. We had a colleague in our office who was diagnosed with terminal cancer just after the pandemic started, and it went down real quick. She, was, she passed away about three weeks later. And we went to say goodbye to her, and we, we stood on the outside of the... Um, the um, not nursing home, where people go to die. Hospice, thank you, thank you. We stood on the outside of the hospice with a phone speaking to her through the window, saying our oh, goodbyes. But this woman has endured that kind of isolation for 12 years. Can you imagine what she's feeling like? And it's a dramatic description. Verse 26, my verse said she'd endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. That's not quite what Mark says. Literally translates, and I wrote it out for myself, it says, having a blood flow, having suffered from many doctors, having exhausted all her wealth, having not improved, but having gotten worse. That's bad English. 
but having got worse, she suffered much from many physicians, exhausted all her resources, and gained nothing. You know, it's this like having a blood flow, having suffered under doctors, having exhausted her wealth, having not improved, but having gotten worse. It's like this hammer blow after hammer blow after hammer blow. This woman has no chance of getting better. She's exhausted all her options. She's been to every medical center. She's spent all that she had. The priests don't want to see her. The Levites don't want to see her. The people in town don't want to see her. She's basically sitting at home waiting to die. It's a tragic, tragic picture. And in verse 20. Seven, it says, literally, having heard about Jesus and having come up behind him in the crowd, she touched his cloak. We switched from the, um, the perfect to the RS tense in this verse here. She touched his cloak. This is the turning point in her spiritual experience. But what started her was that phrase she'd heard about Jesus. Somebody had said what Jesus had done in their life. Because so far in the gospel, there's hardly any teaching from Jesus. It's the parable of the sower in Mark 4, but other than that, you'd be hard pressed to say what Jesus was talking about in Mark 1, 2, 3, 4. Not much there. Matthew has five big sermons, like the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 10 and so forth, but there's not much teaching of Jesus in the first four uh, chapters of Mark, but somebody has said something about what Jesus has done in their life, and it sparked hope in this woman's life. Somebody gave their testimony. Somebody shared what Jesus had done for them. Somebody was willing to say in a world where the religious and social elites mocked Jesus that I don't care what the world says, this is what I know he's done for me. And you're going to have to live with the consequences. And we live in that kind of world today where if you express your faith in Jesus, the social elites of our nation will mock you and view you as some kind of like backward rube in Kentucky or something. No offense to Kentuckians, but you know what I'm talking about. You're a country hick. But she has heard something about Jesus. And notice this, she had heard about Jesus. It doesn't say she'd heard that the disciples who followed Jesus were always arguing about position. And it doesn't say she'd heard that the disciples were arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom of God. And it doesn't say that the disciples wanted to call down fire on those villagers that didn't accept Jesus. It's a good thing that she'd never heard that. What she heard about was she heard that Jesus can heal and Jesus can save. So what do people hear about from you? What do they hear from you? Do they know you as representatives, ambassadors of Jesus here in um, Mentone Church? Or do they hear about the troubles of the saints from you? Do they hear about the political polarization in our nation, how bad this person is or how evil that person is? Or do they hear that there is a better way in this world and that is to follow Jesus? What do people hear from you? Because you may be the only Christian in your school, in your class, in your dormitory, in your place of work, in your clinic, or in your hospital ward. What do people hear from you? You know, I, I, I was showing in the first service today, you know, I had a variety of medical issues in the last five years. I had a broken tibia and fibula, then I had a, a kidney stone and some back pain and a few other things. And um, I was being checked in to have my kidney stone pulled out, uh, which was a... Uh, I won't tell the story because there are kids present. And um, anyway, it was, it was a mess. Uh, for days afterwards, and um, I was preaching a diaper, okay, because, you know, couldn't control myself. I can give you a hint of what was happening, and uh, that was the worst sermon I ever preached. Because <laughs> um, I kept worrying, is it showing or is it not? But anyway, and I can't even remember why I've gone down this path. And my mind goes down these rabbit holes. I have my wife to gently remind me to steer me back to the topic. Um, now, where were we? <laughs> Seriously, I've, I've lost my... My, my chain of thought, uh, something about doctors and medical care, and uh, it'll, if it comes to me, I'll tell you, all right? But anyway, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Somebody once wrote me a note after a sermon that said, Pastor Vine, they said, I did a, a children's story about being forgetful. And my wife sent me into town to put some, had some clothes back on a Friday afternoon, and I couldn't remember when I got to town why I'm in, I'm in town. So I drove around town, and I thought, well, I always go to Lowe's, because like, maybe that's why I came to Lowe's. So I walked around Lowe's thinking, what did I want in Lowe's, but nothing came to my mind. And so I bought some LED light bulbs, because if I'm loads, I always buy LED light bulbs. And I drove home and showed them to my wife and proudly showed I got these LED light bulbs. And she said, um, did you hand the clothes back? Oh, that's what I went to town for. <laughs> and um, uh, she said, what were you thinking about? I said, I wasn't. I said, after 21 years of marriage, I've been institutionalized. I've lost the capacity for rational, independent thinking. So uh, anyway, uh, those of you guys who've been married for many years, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. 
So, anyway, uh, how did we get onto this? Anyway, um, immediately her hemorrhage stopped. All right, she'd heard about Jesus. Oh yeah, I, I was being checked in for my kidney stone, and, and the lady says, well, are you male or female? I said, I'm a penguin. And that's where I was going, and she says, well, what do you mean? And so we had a conversation about you created the image of God, male and female created he them, and what are your options on your hospital system here? I want to know what your options are, and if I say I'm a penguin, you're legally obliged to write that down. Uh, when I flew into New York recently from Morocco, they wanted my gender identity on the, on the landing card. And so I thought about it long and hard, like what do I identify as at 12.01 a.m. today? And I put down jackhammer, and I think some, <laughs> some poor civil servant has to enter this into their database that a jackhammer arrived on flight so-and-so from Morocco. <laughs> anyway, the, the point about this is, and what is the point about this? Yes, the point about it is this, that um, faith in Jesus is expressed in our daily lives. And what do people hear from us? And if people come into contact with us, does it inspire faith in them in the midst of the most direst of circumstances? Do we inspire people to come to Jesus? What do people know you for? When you leave the room, do people remember you from the cut of your clothes or the purity of your speech? Do people remember you for how nice your shoes were or how well groomed you were? Or do they remember you from the fact that you spoke about Jesus? What do people remember about you? I think it's a great goal in life to have a goal, to have an objective that I'll go to a meeting. I don't want anybody to remember what I was wearing, but I want them to know that I spoke about Jesus. If you go through life with that kind of attitude, it's a real blessing. Because if that person had not told her about what Jesus had done for them, this woman would still be suffering in a, in a menstrual lockdown. And she'd have died probably of pain locked away. You don't know the blessing of telling your story. And that story should be about the blessing of Jesus in your life. And so um, immediately she's healed, verse 29. She touches the robe, the robe of Jesus. Verse 29, she's healed. It says, immediately her hemorrhage shocked, and she felt in her body that she was healed of a disease. And immediately aware that power had gone away from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Uh, this is a strange question, isn't it? Because he's in the middle of a crowd. Uh, Luke's, Luke's version says that he was being choked or throttled by the press of the crowd. You know, this is like you're going into a crowded concert or a Super Bowl or some crowded event and everybody's like jostling in on you and your hands are in your pockets so the pickpockets can't get there first, yes? And, and so you, you, your hands are standing there, hands in your pocket, and there's people to, um, pressing in on all sides of you and you're just praying you can get through this safely and there's no stampede. And so this woman, she reaches, she, she worms her way through and she touches Jesus um, on, the, on the hem of his robe, believing that if she but touches his clothes, I will be made well. Now, Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And the disciples are astonished. They say, how can you say that? You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? And there's an important lesson for us here, and it's this. Truly, even today, many press in around Jesus, yet very few actually touch him, and fewer still are touched by him. Amen. The crowd was walking side by side with Jesus. They were following Jesus. They were listening to Jesus. They were seeing everything that he did. They were rejoicing in the incredible miracles he was doing and the teachings he was teaching, but very few of them were actually touched by Jesus in their innermost parts. You can walk and talk as a Christian today and never experience the touch of Jesus. And that is maybe one of the greatest tragedies of the Christian life. You can go through the ritual and the liturgy and the hymns and the classes and the preaching and all the rest of it, but there is still something missing. There is still the lack of the touch of Jesus in my life. So Jesus, I hear that other people have been blessed, but what about me? Where is your touch in my life? And maybe not be a physical touch, but certainly a spiritual touch. It is a tragedy to be ostensibly so close to Jesus and to live the Christian life and yet remain untouched by him in our personal lives. Jesus looks around in verse 32 to see who it had done it. It's an iter of imperfect, the tense, which means Jesus kept on looking around. Jesus was looking for that lady. He knew he'd been touched, and he was looking around for her. And so there's a lesson for us as disciples there. Jesus' persistence in discovering who touched him matched the woman's persistence in getting to him. But the woman wanted a cure. She wanted something, and Jesus wanted an encounter with a someone. She wanted something from Jesus, and Jesus wanted to know her. And 
we must avoid the temptations disciples of Jesus today of following God because of what we get out of it. I will follow you, Lord, if I get this good career. I will follow you, Lord, in the pay rise or the happy marriage or the healthy children. I will follow you, Lord, if there is social applause and public acclaim. But if anything is put on the line, if I have to lose anything for you, count me out. She wants something from Jesus. He wants to know her. And there's a big difference. She had nothing to offer Jesus except her faith and her love. And that's what he was really seeking there. So I want to challenge you today. Do not follow Jesus because you can get something from him. We follow Jesus because of who he is. The fairest and the brightest of them all. The, the benchmark for humanity. The one who, yes, heals. Uh, it was my privilege about four weeks ago. I had a phone call from a lady who'd, who'd um, she's a sister-in-law of, of the Ayatollah of Iran. And a few years ago, she was de death, deadly sick, and she prayed to Jesus, and he appeared to her. And he said, she said to me, he appeared like fire and diamonds. That's how I described him. And he healed me that night, completely healed my body. And I told my family, including the Ayatollah, and I had to flee for my life. And for the last over 15 years, she's fled around the world, avoiding the Iranian secret police. Now she's a refugee somewhere under protective uh, custody, a you know, new identity, and um, an incredible story of a devout Muslim woman who was healed at the height of the Iranian regime, right in the inner circle there, and is now a, a follower of Jesus, who lost everything for Jesus. But she called me because she says, I need to tell my story. People need to know that Jesus appeared to a deathly, de deathly ill woman in a foreign land, and he healed me, despite the, the, the theology that I was espousing. Jesus does appear, appear, and he does heal people today. So Jesus wants to meet you, even if you want something from him. And he invites us today to follow him, not because of what we gain, but because of who he is. Because we follow him as we follow him because of who he is, our characters are transformed. If we follow him because of we want something, we're exacerbating greed in our own lives. And when we lose that one thing, we're tempted to lose our faith in Jesus. And regimes around the world control Christians because of fear of loss. Let's just cut to the chase here. Persecution works because the government takes away your career, your home, your house, your possessions. And people, we do not want to lose these things, therefore we give up our faith in Jesus. And those kind of decisions are coming to America very, very soon. Some of you are already facing questions of conscience. I'm neither pro nor anti-COVID vaccination, but it, it is a question of conscience. And you have to live with your conscience. And if you choose in good conscience to take the vaccine, I thank the Lord. If you choose in good conscience not to take the vaccine, I fully support that as well. But act according to your conscience, because that which does not proceed from faith is a sin. So you need to be convicted that doing X or not doing X is God's will for you in your life. This is not an anti-vaccination talk. It's a pro-freedom of conscience talk. And so Jesus looks not for her um, she looks for him because she wants something. Jesus looks for her because he wants her. And she falls at his feet. It says there in verse 33, But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. Clearly, Hippa didn't apply back there. What did she tell him? She told him about her illness, her diagnosis, her scourge, her whip, her pain her lockdown, her medical history, her bankruptcy, her pain, her suffering, her despair, her hearing, her hope, her pursuit, and her healing. She told him the whole truth. And it's an incredible story, so that everybody knows what's happened to this lady. And truly, if we've been touched by Jesus, we also ought to be willing to testify to the whole truth of what God has done for us. People say, why don't we see the same healing miracles in let's say Loma Linda or Michigan as we see in the Philippines or Iraq or places like that? I believe one of the primary reasons is that too many Western Christians, if God answered a prayer like that, we'd be too embarrassed to tell what has happened. We're not willing to say, I, I prayed about something and God healed me because we're afraid we're gonna be thought to be crazy. And 
even though I've been blessed by, you know, the doctors in Michigan for the multiple procedures in the last few years, I thank God for everybody in the healing professions, whether you were a porter or a janitor or an admin assistant or a surgeon or whatever the case may be in those hospitals, I thank God for every one of you. Because God, God uses you to put people back on their feet, in my case, quite literally. I thank God for the healing arts. But if I am wanting God to heal me, but I am never going to share what God has done for me, why would God heal me? We say to our missionaries in places like India, if a young man comes to you and he's a Hindu and he's got some terrible disease, and he says, would you, would you ask Jesus to heal me? But he's been, in the morning he's gone to um, um, make puja or worship at a Hindu temple. The answer is no, because God is a jealous God and he wants the glory that goes to him. And he's not gonna share his glory with the Hindu deities. If you are going to ask Jesus to heal you, you must step aside from that Hindu deity and, and not offer puja in the temple, and you must come and ask Jesus and Jesus alone to heal you, because then when you are healed, you know it is Jesus that healed you. But if you're gonna cover all your bases, then this isn't gonna work. Uh, the uh, Desire of Ages puts it this way. She says, the gifts which the gospel offers are not to be secured by stealth or enjoyed in secret. So the Lord calls upon us for confession of his goodness. Then she quotes from Isaiah 43, 12. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. That is, you are my witnesses. That means you testify to my goodness in your community. What God has done for you, that means you are his witness. And if you're not willing to be a witness to what God has done for you, why would God do anything for you? So I want to challenge you today to think about what God has done for you, to share what God has done for you, because in opening up to others what God has done for you, you're an opening up space in your life for God to work again in your life. We read again in Desire of Ages, the Lord works continually to benefit mankind. He is ever imparting his bounties. He raises up the sick from beds of languishing. He delivers men from peril which they do not see. He commissions heavenly angels to save them from calamity, to guard them from the pestilence that walketh in darkness and the destruction that wasteth at noonday. But their hearts are unimpressed. He has given all the riches of heaven to redeem them, and yet they are unmindful. By their ingratitude, they close their hearts against the grace of God. Page 348, Desire of Ages. So tell your story, Mentone Church. Open up your life to the touch of Jesus. If we are not willing to confess God's goodness in our lives, why would God continue to bless us? Verse 34, this is the final judgment from Jesus on this lady. It says, he said to her, and you wonder what, you know, this isn't the first woman at the feet of Jesus, is it? The woman caught in adultery was also at the feet of Jesus with a hostile crowd. This is another woman at the feet of Jesus with a hostile crowd and Jesus opens his mouth and what's he gonna say? Like, how dare you come and touch me and how dare you make me ceremonially and clean and did you not think about passing on that terrible uncleanliness to your neighbors and, and the spread and the infection and all the rest of it and why don't you stay in social isolation? No, he does not say that. First thing he says is daughter. There's no reproach, there's no shame, there's no criticism. It's an unexpected term of tender love. I don't think she expected Jesus to say, daughter. I have one daughter, my wife. She's a junior now. You know, she, was like, she was that big yesterday, now she's that big. And I think it's good for a guy to have a daughter because it awakens the tenderness in your character that may never otherwise appear. I have a son as well, so there's rough and tumble there. But having a daughter, uh, you know, having a daughter is good for a guy because it awakens a tenderness that may never otherwise appear. And Jesus turns to her, and he doesn't say woman. He doesn't say you. He calls her daughter. It's a term of endearment. You know, my daughter's name is Christina, but I don't call her Christina at home. We all have pet names for our children, yes? We call her Kiki. You know, and she's happy with Kiki at home. Don't tell her that. But she's happy with Kiki at home. It's a term that expresses love and endearment and tenderness, and I'll do anything for you. And Jesus has healed this girl. He says, your faith has made you well. Now notice this, he doesn't say your touch has made me well, has made you well. He says, your faith has made you well. See, we're standing next to her is Jairus, who's probably looking at his watch and saying, look, my daughter's about to die. Right, you've healed the woman, let's get on with things now. Jesus has a message for Jairus. Before he can get to Jairus' home, Jairus needs to hear that it doesn't matter if Jesus is physically present. It's not the touch that heals you, it's the faith that heals you. 
And Jairus, I need you to learn this lesson because you think I've got to come to your house to save your daughter, but I don't. If you just expressed faith right now, your daughter's illness could be reversed on her deathbed. And so Jesus says to the woman, but he also says to Jairus, who's in the background, your faith has made you well. He then says to her, go in peace. That's what my version says. I don't know what your version says. I'm using the new revised here, but he says, go in peace. And now he doesn't say, some versions say go with peace or go in peace. That's not quite what he says. He uses the preposition into. He doesn't use the preposition with or in. He uses the preposition into. So she doesn't merely depart at peace with Jesus and at peace with the crowd, but she's now, she can leave and she can enter into a new experience of peace. She's entering into peace because Jesus has touched her life. Why can she do that? Because for the first time in her life, maybe she now knows that she is the daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And every daughter then and now has a God-given right to expect her father to watch over her, to protect her and to provide for her. Amen. Now these days we decry that as toxic masculinity. It's part of Satan's attack on manhood. But every daughter has the right to expect that her father will protect her and provide for her and watch over her. When my daughter was, when she graduated from elementary school, you know, all the kids, they did these little talks, you know, at the school, like, thank you, mum, for this, and thank you, dad, for that. And I was sitting there thinking, what's she going to say? Because she's got a red, she's got a, a shock of red hair. And, um, I know, sometimes she's gentle and meek, and sometimes she's, the fiery Irish blood comes out of her. And I'm like, what's she going to say up there today? And she's th she said, thank you, mum, for cooking with me. Thank you, mum, for going shopping with me. Thank you, mum, for talking with me about my friends and all this kind of stuff. And... And I think, what's she going to say? And then she says, Dad, she says, thank you for making me feel safe. Now, as a guy, that's more important than thank you for loving me. Amen. My job is to make her feel safe. Amen. She can go into peace when she goes home at night. She can go into peace when she goes anywhere with her father. And this woman can go into peace because she has the affirmation, and we need that affirmation today, that we are sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we can leave this house of worship into the world, but we can also enter into peace, knowing that the one, that if, he, if, he, who, if he is with us, who can be against us? And that he is greater than all those who are against us. And that his purpose is our eternal salvation, that his power is infinite and his authority is supreme. And so this woman, she enters into peace because she's had contact with Jesus. Meanwhile, we come to the other end of the sandwich, and time is moving on here. So verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? The delay with the woman has been fatal for Jairus' daughter. She is dead, why bother Jesus any more? Low expectations of God lead to low results. She's dead. Don't even bother asking him to come to the house. He can't, nothing can be done. She's dead. If we have low expectations of God, guess what will happen? We'll see low, low results. Uh, William Carey, the famous missionary to China, said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. And missionary work is a story of boldness. We have to have a boldness for God, a holy boldness that goes forward knowing the risks but knowing that he that is with us is greater than those that are against us. And knowing that oftentimes he has already gone before us and has already prepared a harvest of righteousness. We just have to discover it when we get out there. They have low expectations. Don't come to the house. She's dead. Why bother Jesus? And Jesus responds. It says, overhearing what they said, Jesus said to, to Jairus, he said, do not be afraid, only believe. Let's have a verb. It doesn't say have faith. It's a verb, that is, live your faith. Now is the test of faith. Do you want me to come to your house, or shall I go to somewhere else now? The child is dead. You've just seen I could, touch, I could heal this woman, and it was her faith that healed her. So now, Jairus, your faith is on the line. If you want your daughter to live, you're going to have to trust me that I can rescue her from the grave. Or you can listen to these, these uh, hard-bitten empiricists who say that earthly realities are everything, and she's dead, so just give up. What's Jairus going to do? There is faith and there is fear. And many people in our country today are crippled by fear. And fear is beyond reason or logic because it is an emotion. You can't rationalize somebody out of fear. It is perfect love that casteth out fear. And so for people who are crippled by fear, 
I believe the best response as Christians is to show them the compassion of Jesus, to love them in practical ways, to help them see that yes, there's a terrible pandemic, but no, you don't have to be crippled by fear. You can still live a life that is worth living. You can still love and receive love. You can still be a blessing in your community and be open to ministry from other people. Love drives out fear. And where there is fear, there is little faith. And so Jairus must choose. Must he, fo chose, must he focus on the circumstances of his daughter's death or he focus on what Jesus has just done for the woman with the issue of blood? Yeah, nine con syllables. That took, much, took a bit of time, didn't it? Yeah. But, but uh, likewise, we must choose. Will we focus on the visible circumstances before us or will we choose on focusing on God for whom all things are possible? Where are we going to focus? Jeremiah 32, 22 says this, 27, See or behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh, is anything too hard for me? Keep on believing, says Jesus. It doesn't just say only believe. It's, it's a present imperative and it's got a continuous sense that is believe now and keep on believing because you're going to run into obstacles and the faith is going to carry you through that fear and the faith is going to carry you through that uncertainty and the faith is going to carry you through the naysayers and the faith is going to carry you through whatever this world throws at you. You've got to keep on believing. And that living your faith and expressing your faith. And Jairus, you're going to express your faith now by walking with me to your house. That's how you're going to express your faith. You see, expressing your faith doesn't always mean standing and preaching in the pulpit. Jairus, you're going to express your faith by walking down this road with me to your home address. Something as simple as that, but which your friends are telling you is pointless at this moment in time. So expressing your faith doesn't have to be converting multitudes. It Maybe it's expressing the little things of life as well as in the big decisions of life. And so they come to the house, they find the professional mourners there, people are weeping and wailing loudly, and Jesus says the child is not dead, but the child is sleeping, and they laughed at him, at that moment their artificial lamentation turns into sincere mockery. Once again, those mourners represent the hard-bitten realists of the 21st century, who insist that empirical realities and science override divine possibility. And because they have this attitude, they close themselves off from witnessing the miracle of the child's resurrection. You see, if the crowd had said, Jesus, we believe, we want to see you raise the child from the dead, he would have raised her from the dead in front of them all, just as he raised the widow of Nain's son in front of the whole crowd, and Lazarus in front of the whole crowd. But because they close off their hearts to unbelief, therefore God does not allow them to see the miracle that's about to take place. So does your heart close to the possibility of God working? If you fundamentally don't believe that God is going to do anything for you, you're not going to see him do anything for you. And one of the reasons we come to church is that I may come to church and I may say, I don't see God acting in my life at all. And the person sitting next to you and says, oh, brother, but this is what happened and this is what happened and this is what happened. We can all see God at work in your life. You just can't see it for yourself because you don't expect it and you've closed off that possibility in your mind. So come to church, and if you see God at work in somebody else's life, tell them, because they may be blind to it for themselves. And it may help change their own experience with God. They may be more open to God rather than having a closed heart when they come to church. Faith truly is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Hebrews 11, verse 1. We want answers today quickly, instantly, yesterday if possible. Yet we are invited to be still and know that I am God at the end of Psalm 46 and verse 10. Because when we wait upon God in submission, we open up avenues for him to work in ways that we have never experienced before. And I can tell you stories today, but our time is pressing. I won't tell you, but I'd simply say this. In the mission field, because everything in the mission field is a challenge and it's a war between Christ and Satan, when there is a problem, if you jump to the human solution, you're often, often making the problem worse. Oftentimes, the best solution is to wait and pray and fast and say, God, this is what we see as the solution, but you have an infinite variety of solutions. We're going to wait and pray and fast so that you'll be glorified and you'll work something out for your glory that's beyond our expectations. So if you are facing a tragedy or a difficult choice um, or um, an unfortunate event in life, don't just jump to the obvious human solution. Wait and pray about it. Fast about it. Why do fasting and prayer go together? Well, if you spend two hours a day on food prep and eating and feeling drowsy afterwards and washing the dishes, if you don't eat for the day, you've got two hours suddenly created for prayer out of a busy schedule. 
you know, I will food my, my wolf my food down in like 30 seconds. My wife told me before I came here, whenever you go and eat in people's houses, watch the pace at which they're eating. You mustn't finish your plate in one minute. It doesn't look good. And, uh, and, and so I often don't remember what I ate. And she said, did you like it? I have to look at her plate to remind myself what was it I just ate, you know? If it was, you know, an English plate of, you know, chips and fried fish with gold, um, mushy, mushy bean, peas on it and salt and vinegar, and I'd remember that. But that soul food I only get about once every five years. Uh, but so, uh, and again, I've lost my place here. Oh, yes. <laughs> Praying and fasting. If, if you pray, if you fast, you create time for prayer. If you fast, you feel weak. What you're saying to God is... Um, I'm submitting myself to you, and um, if there is victory, it comes through your strength, not through mine, and to you be the glory. So if you're facing a decision right now, maybe about employment, pray and fast about it, and act as and when the Holy Spirit prompts you. And act in good faith, and see what God does for you. He may open up for you. You may see options A, B, and C before you, and none of them are good, and God may give you option D, E, or F. So wait and see what God can do for you. And so we carry on with the story. He comes into the room. The crowd are not there because they've closed themselves off to the possibility of Jesus working a miracle. Therefore, they're not going to be allowed to see a miracle. And Jesus, he comes in. The three are with him, Peter, James, and John, the child's mother and the father. They went into where the child was. And in verse 41, it says, He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with amazement. Now Jesus doesn't call her by her name. He doesn't say Hadassah or Rebecca or Rachel or Sarah. He uses an extremely intimate term. Like I would say to my daughter, Kiki. He's using a term of extreme tenderness and endearment. He's letting Jairus know that I feel the same way about your daughter as you, her earthly parent. She's not only precious to Jairus, she's precious to God. And literally, Talitha means little lamb. Little lamb, this is the good shepherd. The good shepherd who knows his sheep. And when the good shepherd speaks, his sheep will hear his voice and they will answer his voice even beyond the grave. This is the good shepherd speaking who lays down his life for the flock. The others out there who mock me, they are hired hands and bandits. But I came to give life, that you might have it abundantly. Little lamb, this is the good shepherd speaking. Please get up. It's a beautiful image of Jesus. Jesus calls his sheep by name today, and he leads them out. Missionaries in the field see this with their children, with broken and abused bodies and snatched innocence in some parts of the world. They are still little lambs to Jesus Christ. Our children today, who many of them go through incredible abuse, and they're incredible, they have a lot of brokenness, are still little lamb to Jesus Christ. For believing parents, this passage is the promise that one day you will see your little child again. That the good shepherd who could raise this girl can raise your child. It's natural to bury your parents, but it's not natural to bury your children. As a pastor, I hate weddings and I love funerals. It's kind of perverse. Because at a wedding, sorry, at a funeral, nothing worse can go wrong. But at a wedding, everything can go wrong, and it generally does. But Jesus comes to these weddings, this funeral, and you, you don't find Jesus coming to funerals and leaving it still a funeral throughout the Gospels. When every time Jesus comes to a funeral, he turns it into a celebration. This, this text is the promise of the resurrection for the dead children of parents who have faith in Jesus. So what Jesus says to Jairus, do not be afraid, but keep on believing, applies to us today. If you've lost a child, keep on believing that one day the good shepherd will say, Talitha come, little lamb, arise, and be restored to your earthly parents. The Spirit of Prophecy talks about this. Sister White wrote to a lady who had a miscarriage and a stillbirth, uh, asking whether she would see her child one day. And this is what we read in Child Guidance 565. You inquire in regards to your little one being saved. Christ's words are your answer. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Remember the prophecy, and then she quotes from Jeremiah 31. Thus saith the Lord, 
a voice was heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refused to be comforted. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to thine own border. This promise is yours, writes Sister White to a woman who suffered a miscarriage. You may be comforted and trust in the Lord. The Lord has often instructed me that many little ones are to be laid away before the time of trouble. We shall see our children again. We shall meet them and know them in the heavenly courts. Put your trust in the Lord and be not afraid. End of quote. The gospel is truly good news. And because I believe that life begins at conception, and I hear from ladies who have gone through abortions, they ask, will I see my child again? I believe on the basis of this passage, yes, you will. That there will be a time of reunion with every child who's perished in our world from conception onwards. It's a beautiful promise. Somebody asked me during the break, they said, you know, why do some people see answers to prayer and other people not see answers to prayer like this? I gave an illustration. I have a cousin. Uh, she was a, an actuary in the city of London, did a doctorate in applied statistics. And uh, she wasn't married. And she, her prayer for many years was that she would find a husband and have a family. And then in her, about the age of 32, she was diagnosed with stomach cancer. It was aggressive and it spread throughout her entire body and she passed away shortly thereafter. When she was dying, she said to her mum, she says, Mum, I prayed for many years for a husband and I prayed for little children. And I thank God now that God said no to me because I would be dying and leaving those children without a mother. So I don't know why some, answers, some prayers don't seem to be answered as dramatically as Jairus's, but what I do know is that God knows the end from the beginning and he does not lead us except as we would otherwise wish. And so we are asked by Jesus in this passage to, even if you don't understand, to keep on believing, because I have the authority to raise your loved ones from the grave again. So what do we conclude today? And our time is up. What does this sandwich mean? Jairus comes to Jesus, and then there's the story of the girl. In the middle, you have the meat of the sandwich, the woman with the issue of blood. Well, unlike the woman, Jairus has a name, social standing, position, and status. He's well respected. She is merely known and defined by her shame and by her uncleanliness. She has no name. She's in perpetual lockdown. Jesus, a Jairus approaches Jesus from in front, she timidly from behind. He can tell his whole story and win public sympathy. She can't say a word about it without receiving public um, uh, opprobrium and hatred. But despite her gender, her namelessness, her uncleanliness, and her shame, it is she who exemplifies true faith, not Jairus in this story. When Jesus said to Jairus, do not be afraid, keep on believing, he was inviting Jairus and us to manifest the same faith as did that nameless woman. That faith means today choosing to look in faith to Jesus, not in fear upon our circumstances. Choosing to trust in Jesus despite all the evidence to the contrary. It is a faith that knows no limits, no, not even the raising of a child from the dead. So my charge to you today is this. Never give up on your children, as did Jairus, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. Jesus doesn't. He fought for that little girl beyond the grave and raised her from the dead. Learn about Jesus and live your faith in your daily life. Do not just say, I believe in Jesus, but I believe in Jesus. I live my faith in my business, in my practice, in my home. I will express my faith in every decision that I make. Testify publicly to God's goodness in your life, and thereby you will open your life to the healing touch of Jesus. Do not allow the fear of your circumstances to cripple you or overwhelm you today, but invite you today to turn your eyes upon Jesus and trust in him and discover that for him, all things are possible. May God bless you as you live for Jesus here in Mentone is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, thanks so much for joining us today for our church worship service here at the Mentone Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're here to serve. So if you have a Bible question or if you have a prayer need, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our phone number is 909-492-492. 0738. Or you can email us at office at mentonechurch.org. And if you find yourself in our area, which is in the inland area of Southern California, please come by and visit us. We would love to meet you. And in the meantime, 
please subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to click on the little bell. That way you'll receive notifications when we are live streaming. God bless. Have a great week.